All right. Hi. Uh, I'm Yaniv. I'm one of the co-founders at The Graph. And uh, The Graph is an indexing and query protocol for blockchains. Um, so, uh, you know, we really believe that, uh, you know, we want software to be built on a solid foundation. And I often get this feeling that um, the way that software is deployed globally today um, is a bit like building on quicksand. Um, and so I think, you know, all of us in this room are probably here to try to uh, work on this problem. And we're at the very kind of, you know, beginning stages of this. And, um, you know, it, it starts by building on protocols that have certain guarantees, right, around stability, openness, uh, security, uh, verifiability. And, um, uh, you know, it, right now we're focused a lot on, like, financial use cases and, you know, DeFi, DAOs. There's, you know, a lot of these early cases uh, coming up. But, um, you know, we, we really believe that, like, this is just how all software should run eventually, that, you know, you have protocols that provide these guarantees, um, and you kind of build up from there, and that that's going to allow, um, you know, society and civilization to, you know, scale and coordinate in ways that, uh, you know, we can't do today. So uh, the problem that we solve is uh, once you try to build an application on top of a blockchain like Ethereum, you quickly realize that it's actually pretty hard to get the data that you need directly to your front-end application. All right, so you're building some kind of web or mobile app, and you want to you know, run some kind of query to get some data. You want to maybe filter, search, paginate, and uh, maybe you try to do this using like Web3.js or something like that, and basically it either takes too long or um, you, know, you kind of have to just load all of the data on the client and filter it locally, and, uh, and you kind of get stuck. And basically the problem is that blockchains uh, are missing this indexing layer. Uh, so when you have a database, a database maintains indexes. So you know, on, at the, the bottom of the stack, it's using the file system to like, store uh, essentially like logs uh, and data, and then um, on top of that, it builds these indexes so that it can run these queries where it can efficiently retrieve the data that you want to get from the database. And blockchains, they're really good at uh, transactionality. Uh, so if you want to set up rules for who's allowed to update some state, um, the blockchain can enforce that and they can build you know, these blocks up. Uh, but making data efficient for retrieval is you know, kind of outside of the scope. Uh, so uh, that's where the graph comes in, where um, we're building a decentralized network of nodes that uh, can index that data in a, reproduce, in, in a uh, um, uh, yeah, reproducible way and uh, make it available for querying uh, so that clients can uh, access that data efficiently. Uh, so basically, uh, the way it works is uh, you define what's called a subgraph. And a subgraph basically defines how to index that data in a reproducible way. Um, so uh, all data on the graph comes from a Web3 data source. So that's kind of the box on the right there. And that's really important for us, that um, in order for this to be uh, reproducible, uh, it's important that the data doesn't come from any sort of Web2 data source. Right? If we allowed you to just hit some kind of HTTP API, uh, that API could return different data every time, and uh, you, you wouldn't have that reproducibility. So uh, right now we support Ethereum and IPFS, and we're going to be adding more data sources, more blockchains, uh, more storage networks, more protocols uh, over time. Um, then you uh, define these mappings, uh, which are compiled to WASM, so you can do any arbitrary uh, data transformations. Uh, on the data from those data sources. Uh, so if you need to do aggregates, um, if you want to kind of denormalize the data, um, transform it so that it matches um, you know, an arbitrary schema, then you can do that with your mappings. Uh, that gets put into a store and then served up over a GraphQL API. Uh, so who here has used GraphQL before? Okay, so not a ton of people. So, so the quick pitch on GraphQL is it's the easiest, uh, most convenient way to fetch data from a server. And instead of REST, where you have one endpoint per resource, where likely the endpoint doesn't have exactly the data that you want, uh, which then forces you to make like multiple round trips, and there's kind of just this mismatch between what the server provides and what the client wants, uh, 
uh, you can define the entire schema up front. You say, here are all of the different entity types. This is how re they relate to each other. And then the client can ask for exactly the data that it wants. Um, and you get just that data back in a single response. Um, so it's really an API that's designed for consumers of an API where you can get exactly the data that you want back. Uh, so um, I'm going to show a brief demo of um, the graph. So, so this is Graph Explorer. You can see it if you go to the graph.com slash explorer. And you can see some of the, the featured subgraphs we have at the top here. And then um, there's a bunch of subgraphs that people are like building and deploying uh, every day. Um, so uh, we can take a look at some of these. So there's uh, this like Melonport one. And uh, I'm going to try to zoom in a little, see if that works. Um, so here you can see that like this, the subgraph is fully synced. So this is the latest block on, uh, on mainnet. And you can see this kind of GraphQL schema on the right here. Maybe I can make it even bigger. Um, so uh, in Melonport, they're like a, a fund protocol on Ethereum. And you can see it's a really rich schema. There's all of these different like entity types. This is just kind of GraphQL. Uh, so you can see these like investors and trading and shares and policies and like all of these things. Um, so if I check out like a fund, so a fund has a name, it has a manager, it has like all of these fields on it, and you can see that it's all like relational. Um, so you know, a fund, uh, for example, refers to like the investment history, and I can click on the investment history and see what that's got, like the shares and the share prices and the amounts. Uh, and then uh, you can run queries kind of in this playground here, and we stand up um, uh, this, uh, GraphQL API, so these are public endpoints, HTTP and WebSocket endpoints that you can hit directly from your web or mobile app. So the graph acts as like a live API backend that you hit from your apps uh, to get uh, all, all of your data. Uh, so now everything's like super exploded and big. Um, but uh, let's take a look at another one. Uh, so this is Peepith, uh, which is a fun app. It's kind of like a Twitter clone. Um, so we've indexed like uh, 53,000 entities here. Uh, and so these peeps are like, uh, like the tweets. And um, we recently added this like saved queries feature. So you can you know, type a query and then give it a name so it's easy to find. So uh, this, for example, is like PP users and their followers. So if I want to grab the accounts and get their names and then their followers, uh, I can do that. I hit play. I get back those responses. And, um, and what's cool is even if I don't know what data is available, I can hit like control space and I get this like autocomplete. So I can see that if I want for these followers, I could get like uh, any of these additional fields. Uh, so maybe I want like, um, see if they have an avatar URL for the followees. And, uh, and if they have them, then it shows up in the response there. Um, so you can see it's like relational this way. Uh, another cool one might be, I'm going to drop this for a second. So here I'm looking for the peeps. And uh, I can get like the content. And um, let's do the, uh, we can do like repl replies or let's just do the timestamp. So that's, that's just like a super simple one. So here's a bunch of like peeps. So you could see you could like really easily build like a, a Twitter type clone on top of this API. Um, you can ask for just the data that you want, you get it back. Um, and so that's how you kind of query data and use the graph to get the data that you want. Um, so now I'll show you uh, what it's like to build one of these subgraphs. Uh, so the first thing is uh, you can come here and just sign up or sign in with GitHub. Uh, so we do like an OAuth thing and I already have an account so it just pops me right back here. And then uh, you get a dashboard where uh, I can see like my subgraphs. 
And uh, here's a subgraph by this project uh, called Afogado um, that's doing like a coffee supply chain on Ethereum, uh, which I think is pretty cool because uh, you know coffee is an example of like some you know market where um, you know prices are really opaque, and um, you know these farmers aren't getting a lot of money for their labor, and so you could create this kind of direct to consumer or any kind of um, you know, marketplace uh, to, to connect people directly to these farms. Uh, so you can see that like, you know, farms have names and they're in like, you know, regions and you can check out like the batches um, and all this stuff for this coffee. Uh, so I've got a uh, subgraph that's created here and it starts with uh, this manifest. And uh, can you guys see that? Cool. Uh, so in your manifest, you specify the data sources. So uh, this is going to be an Ethereum contract. Uh, here's the contract address. And then these are the events that I want to listen to. And so there's different types of triggers. Um, so we support events. And recently, we added call handlers as another kind of trigger. So you can trigger any time a smart contract function is called. You could use that as a trigger. Um, and then uh, you specify the handlers that get called. Um, then you specify your GraphQL schema. So this looks very much like uh, what we were looking at before. This is standard GraphQL. It defines basically the, uh, the data model. Uh, and then you have your mappings. So, so the mappings are built in a subset of TypeScript called AssemblyScript, which compiles to WASM. Uh, so, so this is pretty cool. We, we kind of looked at all the different ways that you could build for WASM. And we thought that this was like the easiest to learn since everybody knows JavaScript or, or TypeScript. Um, it just has like a few quirks, but we've added a bunch of tooling to make it really easy to, to build on top of this. Uh, so here we're handling this add cut profile event. And uh, you get the event and then you have access to the event data, the transaction data, the block data. Uh, you can get smart contract state as of this block, and we basically like event source. So we'll start at the first block, and we'll run through everything, and we'll just like run all the handlers, index all the data, and it's available over GraphQL. Um, and what's cool is, uh, you know, we generate all of these types for you based on like the schema and on the ABIs, uh, so you get autocomplete on everything. Uh, so here we can see that um, we've got like these cut profiles. And they have like some data, but they don't have like all the data that we might want. And I happen to know that this contract um, it has like aroma and some like other information about like these cut profiles for this coffee uh, that I think would be cool to show to users. Um, so I could easily uh, add that data uh, and index it uh, in my subgraph. So basically, I come down here and um, I say I want to. Uh, add some data to this cup profile. Say I want to add like the aroma, and I can get that data off the event. So uh, I get like autocomplete here, and I know that uh, that data is available on the event parameter. Uh, so I can look in there, and I can see like here's everything that's on the event. So I want to grab like the aroma, and then I'll call two strings. So this is the kind of um, assembly scripty stuff for WASM to make it happy. And then let's get just a few more fields. So we'll do the flavor. And uh, the acidity, let's say. Let's just do those three. And I added an extra dot. So I just extended the subgraph to put some more data. Underscore. Underscore. Thank you. That's I deleted the wrong one. See, and it gave me the red squiggly so I knew at compile time. Cool. So now um, I can jump into my terminal. And um, I can uh, basically deploy. And that's going to. I could start first by just doing a build. So basically what it's doing here is it's uh, compiling the assembly script. It's uploading the WASM files uh, to IPFS. It's 
hashing the manifest, uploading that to IPFS. So everything's on IPFS. And then I get back this uh, subgraph ID, which is that IPFS hash, which uniquely identifies uh, this version of this subgraph. So it's like content addressed. Uh, and then I can deploy that uh, to the hosted service. Uh, so right now we're running a bunch of nodes for you. Uh, this is this like intermediate step on the way to the uh, fully decentralized network. Uh, so right now I'm just going to deploy this to the hosted service. Uh, I should be able to come back and uh, see it indexing here. So we support making like zero downtime upgrades. Uh, so that current version is still running. Um, and if you know my app is hitting that endpoint, it would keep running. But in the background, uh, it's syncing this new version right now. So you can see the little progress bar is going through. It's chugging along through all the blocks. It's indexing data you know, whenever it sees the events. And uh, in the meantime, I can come here and I can see that in the cut profile, um, I should have uh, some more data. And I should be able to query it. Um, so, uh, so that's the graph. Let me go. Um, so how am I doing on time? When did I start? Oh, perfect. Um, so the kind of data that um, you know, I'm excited about in kind of the short term, I mean, basically, we want to just be indexing all of the data uh, from all different uh, networks, make it really easy to, um, to access and uh, so that people can build applications on top of fully decentralized protocols. Um, and you know, in the short term, um, you know, the, the stuff that really excites me about this is the opportunity to create like global open markets for everything uh, where, you know, people don't have to, um, you know, give away power to these like large centralized entities um, that exert their market power, um, you know, to, to extract. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the, in the short term, examples of that would be just... Um, you know, DAOs. Uh, so there's a bunch of like DAO protocols. Uh, DAO stack uses us. Um, uh, and uh, we're uh, getting started in engagement with like Aragon and um, uh, Colony. And all of these DAOs I think are really exciting. Uh, Moloch uses us. So you can check out like all of the, uh, the proposals and, and everything on, on Moloch. Um, uh, things like you know Gitcoin and places where just any kind of marketplace where um, you know people can basically vouch for each other's skills and you can like perform tasks and um, you can like find uh, people to uh, perform tasks. I think you know all of this kind of stuff should be on Web three, and when it's all available like this, people will be able to build more and more applications. They'll be able to customize them, um, and uh, you'll know that. All of this software can continue to run forever, and you can build on it. You can, tr uh, you know, trust in it. Uh, it's, you know, kind of a, a stable foundation for for large scale coordination. Uh, so, if you're building in the space, if you're building on Ethereum or other blockchains, uh, please reach out. We'd love to help. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the talk, Yanni. Uh, Quick question about the interaction between the uh, the query layer and the chain. Uh, is it like decoupled in a way that can be used on any other uh, chain as well, or is it tightly coupled with Ethereum? Yeah, so, so in, in the first version, um, it's more tightly coupled than we would like. Uh, but we're specifically going to be adding support for multiple blockchains. Does someone change something there? Because I would bring them closer. Okay. Um, so uh, as part of that effort, we're going to make it like much more modular, uh, specifically so that um, it uses like a plugin architecture where we'll build like the first few plugins to add support for multiple chains. Uh, we're really interested in like Cosmos and Polkadot, for example, adding support for those. Um, and then eventually, anyone should be able to build their own plugin for their own data source. Um, you said in well, thank you for the talk and also great project. Um, the, you said that you currently you support Ethereum and IPFS, right? Um, because you want like uh, cryptographically audible input, right? To to have it be reproducible. What 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 do you mean with or what what is your vision or roadmap for supporting IPFS? Can I push index data into IPFS? Do I try to index data from IPFS? 
right now I think it's used to like initiate the node with instructions. Or? Oh, so, so right now we do use IPFS just ourselves internally as a protocol for basically storing all the metadata for the subgraphs. Um, but so, um, like when you deploy a subgraph, what you're doing is you're uploading, you know, the WASM file and the manifest and everything onto IPFS, getting back a hash. And so a node anywhere in the world could just uh, look up that hash on IPFS to get everything they need to index that data. So that's just how we're using it internally. Um, the way that um, you know uh, projects that are building on the graph can use IPFS today is if you have some data that's stored on IPFS and you have a hash that you then anchor on chain, so you have like in your smart contract you log, for example, the IPFS hash, then in your mapping script you can cat that file, you can get the data, and you can index it um, in your mapping. So for example, uh, I didn't point that out, but with the PPITH subgraph, um, most of that data is actually on IPFS. So that was a pretty complicated subgraph that had to like get a lot of data from IPFS. Uh, so we support that today. And then there's a question of like, um, how would we support IPFS um, outside of the context of, of Ethereum altogether? Um, and that just becomes a little bit harder because, uh, so one way to do that would be, for example, to support IPNS as a data source, and then whenever the IPNS reference changes, then you'd kind of, you know, that could be a trigger. Uh, but the problem is you don't have any strong uh, consensus uh, with like IPNS, it's like eventually consistent. And so we need to figure out how we're gonna deal with that because we want our protocol to maintain consensus. Um, one of the important uh, requirements we had from day one is that if you issue, issue a query, for example, as of uh, some block, then um, there should be one and only one correct response to that query. Uh, so we need to have strong consensus. And so um, that's an open area of research for us because we'd like to be able to you know, support like an orbit DB kind of model or um, like IPNS as a data source and we still need to figure out how to do that. Um, so so are you, on the three points, like the first point, just because I, I'm selfish and I want to dig deeper. Um, so is this, when, when you say like we want to make sure that the input instructions to the node is also verifiable so that different nodes have the exact same instructions, is this sort of in a vision towards um, having consensus on the indexing of different nodes as well? And where what do you see happening there? Yeah, it's, it's just, um, I mean, we think IPFS is just like a great abstraction for like file storage. And so we have this problem of like we need to store the files. And so we weren't going to reinvent the wheel. And so IPFS was a good solution to that problem. Um, we do want the protocol itself to be open and permissionless. And so the easier it, it is for any node to kind of have these guarantees where they know that like the data will continue to be available to them, that's important. Um, and that's why like we only support these strong Web3 data sources as inputs so that you you know, really have these guarantees that anyone at any time could like rebuild the state and um, you know index a subgraph and be able to provide that service. Great, thank you so much again, Yanif. Thanks.